Good morning to all of you. I'm Ken Kaur. I'm the Congregational Care Minister here at Brentwood Baptist Church, and in behalf of our senior pastor, Mike Glenn, our ministers and our congregation, I want to welcome you to Brentwood Baptist Church for this special event hosted by the Refuge Center. You are in for a treat. Brentwood Baptist is committed to mental, spiritual, and physical wellness. And this event today is simply another way of saying to our community, we want you to be all that God intends for you to be. So I hope today that this will be an opportunity for you to grow, to learn, and to change. Let's pray together as we begin this time. Loving God, we come aside today to hear, to learn, to change, and to heal. And so we resolve to leave behind everything that will hinder that and to embrace everything that will foster that. By the power of your Holy Spirit, open our minds to your truth, regardless how new to us. Open our hearts to your wholeness, regardless how difficult for us. So we ask that you would bless each one in this place in a way that is unique to each one. And at the end of the day, remind us to give you thanks. And so it's with grateful enthusiasm that we pray in Jesus' name, amen. The Refuge Center began in 2005 with the hopes of doing a couple of things. One is being a systemic organization where we could serve the whole family in one place. Jennifer Gillette and I also hoped to pair excellence and affordability. Having the sliding scale makes it possible for them to find help. The Refuge Center was created to be just that, a place of refuge, um, a shelter from the storms of people's daily lives. And it really did begin with just this small seed and two therapists, two offices. The Refuge Center grew a thousand percent in its first five years of operation and we've grown 15 to 50 percent every year since. Refuge anticipates seeing 3,000 clients this year and just think about the impact of that many changed lives in our community. The need is definitely so great, not just in Williamson County, but from all the counties. We have a waiting list. We have people who, who need our services, who are hearing about us and want to get in. And we are just really needing more people to come along to work beside us to help in um, closing that gap financially. Mental health issues are often overlooked and um, stigmatized. And I think by helping the Refuge Center, you're also helping us to kind of get over that hurdle. I am at the Refuge Center because I absolutely love being here. I love our mission. Really, Amy and Jen, when they founded Refuge Center, was built around this idea that everyone matters and that everyone needs access to not just services, but excellent services. Oh, the Refuge Center is such a powerful influence uh, in the community and the, and the healing and the, and, and the gift that it brings that it's ministry to, to help people in many walks of life and many different types of, of issues. We need to consider the great amount of courage that it takes. We want them to feel like they have been thought of in advance, that things have been prepared for them. We serve uh, a number of presenting issues, including domestic violence, trauma, sexual abuse, grief and loss, addictions, relational challenges, anxiety, depression, PTSD, the list goes on. Play therapy is just an opportunity for um, younger kids who don't have the verbal ability quite yet. Recently started using neurofeedback here, um, also called EEG biofeedback. So be able to bring it here and be able to have that accessible on a sliding fee scale is um, something I haven't really heard of in any other place. So. I'm pretty excited to be a part of that. The Refuge Center for Counseling means quality care in a Christ-centered environment that is meeting the needs of our community. Everybody is totally 100% committed, every one of our therapists, our staff, the board, to making sure that we do our jobs to the best of our abilities. There is a structure that is built in and a culture that is built in, and I found myself as I joined the board, uh, falling more and more in love with the Refuge with each meeting. They care about the clients and what's going on in the community. 
and I just think it's a wonderful place. I just love this idea that, again, no matter who you are or what you can pay, our dream is for you. The person who can pay $19 deserves access to a place that's one of a kind. As therapists, we witness miracles all the time. People heal from things that they thought would haunt them the rest of their lives. Hope grows at the Refuge Center because other people believe in us and support the mission. Because of the staff that's constantly being developed. It provides an opportunity to process, to heal. It's hope. It's providing opportunities for individuals that otherwise don't know what to do. Get the word out and let people know what's happening here. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Refuge Center for Counseling's 2019 Live Intentionally Speaker Series. We are incredibly blessed that each of you are here this morning and so excited about the content that we're going to share. So I want to start off by thanking our generous sponsors who made this event possible. That includes True Value Hardware, who provided the centerpieces this morning, as well as sponsored the event. The Treatment Placement Specialists of Acadia Healthcare, Pinnacle Financial Partners, Beacon Capital Management, Don Garcia Attorney at Law, TriStar Stonecrest Medical Center, the Bound Brook Advisors, LBMC Employment Partners, and of course Brentwood Baptist for sharing their beautiful space. So it is our deepest hope that this conference will be a blessing to each of you. We intentionally designed the format to engage you as a whole person, so body, heart, and mind. So a couple points to remember before we get started. Number one, this, we are a counseling center, so of course you're going to hear this. Take care of yourself during this event. Um, that means stand if you need to, walk around if you need to, notice what your body needs. Um, feel free to get up and go get more snacks or drinks and then return to your seat. Number two is just um, engage on social media. So it's okay to have out your phone. We would love for you to tweet quotable moments. Um, use the hashtag live intentionally and follow us at the Refuge Center to stay engaged with us after this event. And so before I introduce our keynote, I want to do a brief exercise. Sometimes when my clients come in for the beginning of their session, I will ask them the question, how are you, three times. And the first time I want them to answer from their head, the second time I want them to answer from their heart, and the third time from their gut. And it's so fascinating because many times they have three different responses to that question. Today, I'm going to ask you that question, except I'm going to ask, what do you need this morning? What do you need this morning? For any of you who practice yoga, you know that sometimes when you get on the mat, your instructor will say, arrive on your mat. And what does that mean? It means be present, come to this moment. And then you'll set an intention for your practice, and that intention guides the entire hour. So that's what we're doing. There'll be so much information presented this morning, so much to glean from, but if you know what you need, then your mind, heart, and body will be looking for that this morning, and you're likely to leave more fulfilled. So the question is, what do I need from this morning? So just go ahead and close your eyes with me. If you feel comfortable, if not, you may look at the ground. Um, so check in with your head first. What does your head say that you need this morning? Great. And then next, what does your heart need this morning? Good, and finally, go to your gut, your instinctual center. What does your gut say it needs? Great. So you may take a moment and write that down just so that you can, again, be scanning the conference in a way that your needs will be met. 
I have the great pleasure of introducing Dr. Thomas Cabell. Um, you will want to read his bio in your program. It's very impressive. Um, Dr. Cabell was introduced to us a little over a year ago, and we were so grateful to have him come and speak at Live Intentionally last year. The response to the material he presented was completely overwhelming. There was a line of people about out the door asking him for his notes and PowerPoint and how could they reach him and how could they see him as uh, their physician. And so we knew that the demand was high for him to come back and share more this year. Um, really, the information he's sharing this morning is so critical for such a time as this. Thomas now serves on our board of directors at the Refuge Center for Counseling, and I am so pleased to introduce him. So join me in welcoming Thomas. guys. Is this on? Can you all hear me okay? Okay. Thank you, Amy. That was uh, overly gracious. Um, I was at church Sunday morning, and my wife and I sat with our youngest son up in the front, and I at one moment turned around to look at the number of people, and I thought, oh my goodness, this is next Friday for me. Um, I'm so grateful y'all are here. Um, last year, some, the people that were here last year are going to hear some of this over again, but um, this is a topic I'm extremely passionate about. I would say evangelical at this point, um, and my patients would agree to that, and so would my staff. Um, my hope today is that you walk away with a little bit of my story and how that maybe relates to your own story, because the truth is we're all the same, and we all feel, and we all have a story. And so as I kind of go through this and weave a little bit of my story into this, and you might be wondering, how does the cardiologist even end up here talking about this kind of topic? Um, we're gonna look at that. So without, uh, oh, one last thing. I need to thank my very gracious wife this week. Um, work's been extremely busy, and then I've been working on this talk um, after work a lot, and she's been a single mom, so thank you for all that you've done this week <laughs> to, um, to give me the space to do this. All right, so. See if this works. So we're going to start with a video. just get through. I could leave all this behind. and make sure the cycle ends with me. Learn more about toxic stress and how you can stop it at stresshealth.org. All right, so that video actually appeared on a USA Today article back in, I think, September, October of last year. And it was talking all about how toxic stress in childhood affects us as adults and actually affects our generations after us. We're going to talk a little bit about that today, but I 
came across that video and it's a very powerful video about what we're gonna talk about today because the truth is we all carry stuff. Even if we come from a perfect childhood, we had to leave it and so we have grief there that we have to grieve. And so that's why I really love this quote, the past is never dead, like we carry that with us and it affects us in ways that consciously we're not even aware of. So this is just my story. Um, so I've got a little uh, leeway here. And I've thought about how I would tell this story probably 50 times in the last three months or so. Um, and I think what I just want to impart to you is um, it's a story of redemption. It's a story of grace. And um, it's a story of love, God's love for me and for those around me. Um, four years ago, I was grateful enough to have the opportunity to go to a leadership intensive that was a week long. It was actually four years ago this April. And uh, I had started reading this book by uh, a mentor of mine now, Chip Dodd, who wrote Voice of the Heart. And that book had spoken to me in a way that I, I just couldn't have even fathomed before. And I went to this leadership intensive that was kind of related to some of his work. And it was in that week that I, uh, I read for the first time, many of you may know the laundry list from ACA, I'm not talking about like the Academy of American College of Academics, but the Adult Children of Alcoholics and Dysfunctional Families. And there's 14 points on that laundry list. And the first time I read it, I was like, okay, well, I got maybe 13 of these. Um, I don't have all of them. And, um, it was in that week that I learned about toxic shame. And I remember thinking, oh my gosh, like back the truck up. Like I carry tons of this. And I also remembered this one phrase that stuck with me and really generated a lot of, I think, healthy anger to change. And it was, and this was a group of men. There were five other men that one I knew, the others I didn't, had never met before. And it was what the father doesn't process, the children will carry. And that really got me, like, at that time, um, we had four children. They're 12, 10, 8, and 6, and you'll see them in a minute. Um, but I was bound and determined that my past was not going to be repeated. And what I realized was I was totally repeating my past. Everything that I had tried not to be, I was. And I learned that that oppositional energy to try to be different from what I had experienced as a child just made me the same. And in order to be different, I had to heal. And so in the process of coming out of that week, um, for the umpteenth time, I started therapy. Um, I initially started therapy when I was in the third grade and saw a therapist through junior high and high school. Um, I went through a lot of suicidality. I had a lot of um, anger issues. And it wasn't until I met a man named David Tyner um, who really changed my world. And David is my connection to refuge, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so I finished the intensive. They recommended we started seeing David Tyner, my wife and I, we did. And David basically kind of just started stripping away all of these issues. And, you know, he, he was, I remember the day we were sitting there and he was like, he's like, Thomas, you know what your addiction is, right? And I was like, what addiction were you talking about? And uh, I looked at him after he said it and I was like, damn, you're right. And then about a month later, I was in there and he said, Thomas, you realize you have PTSD, right? And I was like, no, I don't. <sighs> yeah, you're right. And it was just like this series of things that I had not been able to name. And when you can't name it, you can't tame it. You can't do anything with it. And it went long after that, about nine months later, um, that as a family, we made the decision that I would actually go away and do some work. And I did, I had to leave my wife and kids and go do some trauma work. And it was through that that I started to develop this interest in all this stuff. And after coming out of that process and going through all of it, as I started back to work and started to kind of see patients, I started to see my story and all these patients and the things I had experienced physically and those things. And probably nine, 10, a year, 10 months, a year later, at one point, I had been basically referring people that I was seeing in a cardiology clinic. I'd be like, okay, well, 
I hear your story and your symptoms and we've checked everything from a heart standpoint, everything checks out, but something's not right. And here's what I think could be going on. And so I started to basically refer people out to therapy um, and it was working. And so at one point I called David and um, I said, hey, like, do I need to start a foundation? Like all these people, they can't seem to be able to afford good therapists and they need this work. This stuff is everywhere. It's every day in my clinic. I see people affected by drug, ad drug addiction and alcoholism and trauma and other things. And they really don't even know that that's what's affecting them. And that's why I'm giving this talk is to just give you a framework and a background of maybe it's something else that I'm not considering. So if there's an aunt or a cousin or a niece or a nephew that's struggling in something, we're going to talk about some of those things. And so he said, hey, I think you need to reach out to Amy because David and Amy were in school together. And so that led to this conversation and ultimately led to me meeting with Amy and then doing the talk last year and then joining the Board of the Refuge. And now I get to refer people uh, a lot more often. Um, I'm really grateful for the Refuge in so many ways. I think my life's arc and my story has intersected at a time that I could never have imagined if you had told me five years ago that I would be up here giving a talk about things like this. I would have thought you were crazy. Um, and it all comes back to this, this love, and I'm gonna talk about it later, but one of David's real gifts is his ability to weave scripture into therapy. And at one point I can remember very vividly, I'll never forget this part of my story. We were sitting in the office and it was early on and going through a lot of things and uncovering a lot of stuff. And he looked at me and he was like, what are you feeling right now? And I, I couldn't help but say, David, I feel like I'm being punished twice. I said, I know that my childhood and everything I experienced was not my fault. I'd seen Good Will Hunting and I had just bawled at that movie. But I also knew that everything that I was as a result of that, I was like this F5 tornado to my wife, to my kids, to my colleagues at work. And I couldn't fix it, like I couldn't stop it. I couldn't change it as bad as I wanted to. I couldn't make those things go away. And he looked at me, I'll never forget he said this. He said, Exodus 20, Exodus 34, Numbers, Deuteronomy. God says, I pass the sins of the father to the children, to the third and fourth generation. He said, I'm gonna change that word, punish, and I'm gonna tell you that God is pursuing you. God passes the sins to the third and fourth generation, but he pursues the children in those sins. And so that was something that I have hung on to, and it's something that as you see how this transpires, the science is actually now proving the Bible again. Imagine that. We actually have data and we're gonna talk about it as we talk about that second heading about epigenetics, that what we experience, what our parents and grandparents experience is handed to us through the genes. And that's why there's so much what we call legacy burden out there. There's so many people who, who are not even, they're not even realizing how they're affected by something that happened to their great grandmother. And yet they may be triggered, they may carry anxiety or depression, it's not really their own. So that's our path today. We're gonna to talk about trauma and ACE scores. And no, this is not Vegas. Um, this is a quote I love. A lot of uh, my mentor in cardiology training had this on his wall. Um, but we're gonna talk about a different heart. We're not talking about the heart today. We're talking about your real emotional heart. What scientists call the limbic center. And the limbic center of our brain is our midbrain and it's where our emotions are seated. And this is where everything comes from. You always have an emotion before a thought and everything you experience comes through and is filtered through the limbic system. So it's the area of the brain that regulates emotion and memory. It affects all our visceral responses, our stress response, motivations, moods, sensations. And here's the key, it's achronologic. So the example I use in the hospital when I see patients who I clearly experience PTSD with them. So as an aside, as somebody who has PTSD, you typically have a higher what's called limbic resonance. We resonate at 17, 18, 19 hertz. Normal brainwave functions around 10 to 12. So when I walk in a room, 
a lot of times I immediately can sense, wow, this person's got trauma and they may not even know it. And so I can talk to them in a way now that five years ago I had no awareness to. And so the example I use is if I'm standing on a street corner at age 12 or 13 and a drive-by shooting happens and my friend is killed next to me, that memory is just as real in that part of my mind today as it would have been 20 or 30 years ago. And so unless I've healed and done the work around that memory, I can't change the way my brain responds to it because the brain is doing what the brain does. Okay, we talk about PTSD as a disorder. It's not. It's just normal brain function. If my foot is taken off by a lion, I'm going to be hypervigilant around lions. Like, right? My heart rate's going to go up. My, my eyes are going to dilate. My skin's becoming um, acidic. My blood pressure's going to shoot up. My ability to do executive function is going to shut off because I'm like, I got to get the heck out of Dodge or fight or, in my case, many times, freeze, which is the third F in flight, fright, or freeze, which we'll talk about. So the key thing to remember here is things that have happened to you all through your childhood, even things that are what's called implicit memory, things that happened to you before you can really remember, they're all still here and they're all still affecting your conscious mind and your decision making. So it's responsible for interpreting, categorizing, sorting all the input. Everything that comes through our senses comes through our limbic system. And then that key one down there, it regulates the function of the nervous system, which is linked to the immune system, which is linked to the gut. We hear a lot today about gut, brain, axis, right? The limbic system is the core of all this stuff. And so if it's been damaged because you've been neglected or traumatized or never got what you really needed as a child, it doesn't function properly. So those are my four. This was last fall at Pajama Day. So I have two boys who are now almost 12 and 10. There's many me with glasses, right? And then my two girls are now eight and six. So we're gonna talk a little bit about this new paradigm of dis-ease and how these things relate to each other. So in the mid-1990s, the CDC and Kaiser Permanente, they discovered this exposure. It dramatically increases the risk of seven of the 10 leading causes of death in the US. In high doses, there's a dose dependent response. So the more dose you have, the more at risk you are. It affects brain development. So think about that for a second. This exposure actually changes the brain. It changes the way the brain wires. It changes the size of certain areas of the brain. It shrinks one side, one area of the brain called the prefrontal cortex, which is executive decision-making and impulse control. And it increases the amygdala, which is our fear center. It affects immune function, hormones, and even the way our DNA is read and transcribed. Think about that for a second. Those with very high exposure have tripled the risk of ischemic heart disease. Now you maybe see the connection. Lung cancer, irrespective of smoking status. And a 20 year difference in life expectancy. 20 years in a first world country. Think about that for a second. It's a 20 year difference. There is really no other disease or exposure that carries this kind of difference. So you guys get to cheat because you've already seen the title slide, right? It's childhood trauma, it's toxic stress. It's that first video we watched. So the ACE study, we're gonna talk a lot about this. This was a huge study. I never heard of this in medical school. I never heard of this in residency at Vanderbilt. I never heard of this in, re in my fellowship at University of Florida at Sands Hospital. We never talk about this. Physicians are not trauma informed. I'm kind of on a crusade to change that. So it was done in the mid-1990s. We kind of covered that. It's the first large-scale study to look at relationship between 10 categories of adversity. Others have since been looked at, right? Published in 1998, the year I started medical school, surprisingly. And it was the first study to really open the eyes. People think, oh, the ACE study, well, it was like the poor part of, underprivileged part of town. No, it wasn't. It was Brentwood. We'll talk about that. So what is toxic stress? So everybody has stress in their life, right? And we have four kids, I'm a busy cardiologist. My wife does more than I do. I never ask the question with a woman, do you work outside the home is how I ask it, right? 
because they're always like 12 plates in the air. And women, incidentally, I think more than anything, and Amy did a great job, like we need y'all to practice self-care. Y'all are so good at caring for everything around you. We really need you to do the self-care so you have more of you to give away. So a positive stress is this little bump, right? A little blip, a little mini earthquake. It's like, okay, stressful, but hey, we're all good. You get a mild elevation. We're going to talk about some examples. Tolerable is serious and temporary. And then toxic is just, man, day in and day out, this system gets activated over and over and over. So a positive stress response, healthy development. We need stress. It's the same with exercise. If you sit on the couch all day, your body decays. You have to stress it but you also can't come all the way over here and be an Olympic athlete from day one and train 40 hours a week. Your body will blow up. In biology, we know of something called a hormesis. A little bit is good, a lot is bad. (laughs) Sunshine's like that. Vitamin D is excellent. We could talk an hour for vitamin D. Too much sun at the equator, if you've been living here, bad, right? So a little bit is good. Tolerable, that second one we talked about, would be something like loss of a loved one, natural disaster, frightening injury, like several weeks of an intense emotional trauma. And then toxic. Strong, frequent, and or prolonged. Chronic neglect, physical or emotional abuse. How many of you think physical abuse is more damaging to the mind than emotional? Good. Emotional abuse is actually harder on the body and the brain because we're so hardwired for connection. Neglect, caregiver substance abuse, mental illness, exposure to violence, accumulated burdens, poverty is a big one. And this prolonged activation disrupts the development of the brain. When the brain's constantly bathed in cortisol and adrenaline, It changes the way the brain's wired. Why? Because as a biological entity, my body is doing its best to survive. And so if I'm constantly in a stress state, it shunts everything to be more ready for fight, flight, or freeze. And we lose the balance of this other side, which is where we learn to think and executive function and problem solve. I'm not trying to do computational mathematics running from a lion. Just not. Not gonna try to think about that stuff. And so when children whose brains are developing and wiring are chronically exposed to stress, they're at a disadvantage. So everybody knows about this book. I actually brought it here, right? We're going on a bear hunt. My youngest daughter loves this book, right? And this is a great, I thought this was just a beautiful example, right? Where you're going through the woods, you're going over it and all that stuff, right? You're, you're hiking in Jackson Hole or Yellowstone and you come up on a bear. First thing that happens is, oh crap, right? Heart rate jumps up, blood pressure jumps up, eyes dilate, our skin actually becomes more acidic so we taste worse. We shunt, it's true, we shunt all the blood away from our gut and digestion. The muscles get engorged, like we are ready, it's on. And that is a fantastic response if you're in the woods and there's a bear but what if the bear comes home from work every day? Prolonged chronic exposure changes the child. It changes their brain and they can't do anything to stop it. Donna Nakazawa's book, Child of Disrupted, is actually a book I hand to patients, not the book itself, but the Amazon description. So her story is she was coming home from school one day when she was 12 and there was an ambulance in her driveway and her father was being whisked off to the hospital for an urgent surgery. And he later actually died of a routine surgery. It was urgent, but routine. And for the next 30 some odd years, she suffered initially from headaches, dizziness, what we call presyncopal spells. She'd just get lightheaded and pass out. That led to seizures, and she eventually wound up in the hospital with something called Guillain-Barre syndrome, which is an autoimmune disease. 
that basically kills your nervous system, paralyzes you. And it wasn't until she was in the hospital that a physician, a very insightful physician said, are there any childhood traumas or events that would cause you to be so extremely inflamed? And at that point, it kind of opened her up to the possibility that what she had experienced as a child of the loss and the grief and the change in her life that she'd never talked about or dealt with could be responsible for her body's ongoing immune dysfunction. And so her book is all about how our biography, our experience becomes our biology and what we experience as children and young adults and even as adults changes how our body responds to the world. So ACEs are incredibly common. Two thirds of the study had experienced at least one ACE and one in eight had four more. So you're going, I wanna know, what's my score, right? We're coming to that. The ACEs are dose dependent. So again, the higher the score, the more risk you are. I'll show you that in a second. And there were nearly, it was actually 17,000, almost 17,500 participants. 40% had at least a college degree, 75% were white, good jobs, great health care. They were members of the Kaiser Permanente Health Organization. These were not underprivileged families. This is a slide from the study about how these mechanisms work, right? So adverse, I don't know if I have a pointer or not. Let me, no. You can see how things move up from conception, adverse childhood experiences, you get disrupted neurodevelopment, social, emotional, cognitive impairment, and everybody looks different. One child may develop one problem, another child develop a different problem from the same exposure. Adoption of high-risk behaviors, I'm not sure I can even read the others, I'm kind of blurry, sorry. Disease, social problems, and then early death. So what are the ACEs? They occur before age 18, and they fall into three categories, abuse, physical, emotional, or sexual. Emotional or physical neglect, and these are the hardest to prove. It's so hard to prove a negative in somebody's life. It's so much easier for me to say, my dad or mom beat me or this happened or I can point to something because it means at least I was seen, at least they saw me. But if my parents or my caregivers were not able to ever be present or weren't present to themselves, it's so hard to prove that to myself. It's like a hole in my development that I can't ever reach. And so neglect is a much, in my mind, a much harder trauma to deal with. And it's also another point I wanna make, trauma is not drama. We, can, we talk a lot about big T trauma and little t trauma. Household dysfunction, parental mental illness, so depression. And this is not, please don't hear this as to throw shame on anybody who's struggling with a mental illness and hear anything else. This is just a fact of how we develop. An incarcerated relative, mother treated violently, and not being raised by both biological parents. So just parental separation, or divorce. Making sure everybody's got that. Frequent exposure to ACEs without buffering support of a caring adult can disregulate the child's response. Two out of three adults with one ACE, one in eight have four. I'm unfortunately in that group. If you have four or more ACEs, you're four times more likely to suffer depression, eight times more likely to become alcoholic, 12 times higher risk of suicidality, 20 times more likely to use inter intravenous drugs. It's not the drugs, it's the ACE scores. We have an opioid crisis in this country. I'm, we're dealing with it in healthcare. You can't, the war on drugs doesn't work. We take people who have been traumatized and we shame them more. It doesn't work. And I'm just as guilty for years. I said, why can't you just quit? Not realizing I'm an addict on my own. They need grace, they need love, they need support. We have to be willing to look at our own stuff though before we can actually help somebody else. 
double the lifetime risk of heart disease and cancer. And again, a 20 year difference in life expectancy. That's crazy to me in this day and age, as much as we're trying to help people live healthier, healthier, fuller lives, that we don't talk about this. With seven or more ACEs, they're three times the risk for lung cancer, irrespective of smoking status, and three and a half times the risk of what I deal with every day, ischemic heart disease. Subsequent research has explored relationship between other things. So I'll tell you, bullying was a huge thing for me growing up. I grew up in not such a nice neighborhood. I think I saw my first line of cocaine done when I was in the sixth grade. My neighbor down the street, two of his brothers were in prison. I was a small, skinny kid with bad asthma. Couldn't run, couldn't play sports. My parents divorced when I was 12. What do you know, my asthma went away. Not to, I'm scared this will sound like ego, but I later on became most athletic in high school, played three sports, played some college fo football. Like I went from being a kid who tried to play soccer and had to play goalie because he couldn't really run up and down the field more than once to that. And I talked about last year, what do we treat kids with asthma with? Cortisol and adrenaline. We support their immune system. Now I'm not saying that every asthmatic kid, that's the issue. But it's interesting, the article in USA Today that I talked about at the beginning, Nadine Burke, who was like the champion of this stuff, her case story in the article is about a young girl. They had looked at every known cause and couldn't figure out till one day her mother comes and goes, well, every time her dad puts his fist through the wall, her asthma gets worse. So Al Race is the deputy director of the Center for Developing Child at Harvard. I'm gonna show you a video from them in a second. So to give them credit, huge body of science, huge body. I, and putting this talk together, I literally went from like 80, 90 slides down to this because I'm trying to con like pull a symphony down to a piccolo. It shows the connection between early stress of life with a wide range of health problems. I think I passed over it up here a second ago. I'll go back real quick. Here it is. The higher your ACE score, the higher the likelihood of developing long-term health problems, heart disease, stroke, cancer, and diabetes. And I'll add in here, ADHD, anxiety, depression, addiction, and autoimmune disease. They're all the same thing. They're all insecure attachment disorders. When our brain doesn't get what it needs from a social connectivity standpoint, it goes on flight, flight, or freeze. As I said earlier, that's connected to the immune system and the nervous system. And so one person's trauma manifests as ADHD, one person's trauma may manifest as cancer, one person's trauma manifests as addiction. Now I have to sprint through these. Okay. So here's how, just a quick video of how toxic stress changes the body and the mind. They do a better job than I could. Oop. All right. Learning to deal with stress is an important part of healthy development. When experiencing stress, the stress response system is activated. The body and brain go on alert. There's an adrenaline rush, increased heart rate, and an increase in stress hormone levels. When the stress is relieved after a short time, or a young child receives support from caring adults, the stress response winds down and the body quickly returns to normal. In severe situations, such as ongoing abuse and neglect, where there is no caring adult to act as a buffer against the stress, the stress response stays activated. Even when there is no apparent physical harm, the extended absence of response from adults can activate the stress response system. Constant activation of the stress response overloads developing systems with serious lifelong consequences for the child. This is known as toxic stress. Over time, this results in a stress response system set permanently on high alert. In the areas of the brain dedicated to learning and reasoning, the neural connections that comprise brain architecture are weaker and fewer in number. Science shows that the prolonged activation of stress hormones in early childhood 
can actually reduce neural connections in these important areas of the brain at just the time when they should be growing new ones. Toxic stress can be avoided if we ensure that the environments in which children grow and develop are nurturing, stable, and engaging. To recap graphic form what we talked about earlier percent of alcoholism related to a score we have to go through these kind of quick underlying depression women are more at risk than men antidepressant prescriptions suicide attempts risk of perpetrating domestic violence hurt people hurt people impaired worker performance this is the end of this section. Adverse childhood experiences are the single greatest unaddressed public health threat facing our nation today. The past president of the American College of Pediatrics. All right, epigenetics. I can talk for an hour on this one alone. The parents eat sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. The Lord is slow to anger and filled with unfailing love, forgiving every kind of sin and rebellion, but he does not excuse the guilty. He lays the sins of the parents upon their children. The entire family is affected, even children in the third and fourth generation. You know, one of the problems we have with addiction in this country is for every addict in the house, three more are created. It's a virus. An addict can't be present. They can't be emotionally supportive. And so the people around him learn to cope. This is from the Center for the Developing Child. Just wanted you to see early experiences can alter gene expression and affect long-term development. So this is a fascinating topic that we are not really our genes, we're our experience and our parents and grandparents' experience. So the, this is how I discuss it with patients. So Romeo and Juliet is your DNA, it's your genome. It's the script Shakespeare wrote. You'll get a very different play between Edmondson Elementary, fifth grade, and Broadway, right? It's the production, the actors, the directors, all that stuff. That's epigenetic. That is all the things that go into what turns on and off your genes. Stress turns on and off genes. It shuts down some and increases others. There are books now on the consequences of loneliness from a medical standpoint. And so, it's estimated by the CDC that probably only 15 to 20% of our genes are responsible for our disease. It's not, well, my dad had this, so I'm gonna have it too. Well, your dad had it and you grew up in that household, so you have the same microbiome, you have the same way of dealing with stress that you learned that was taught you by the time you were seven. Our brains until the time we're seven are basically on a hypnotic state, they're in delta state. And so everything we see and witness up until age seven basically becomes our programming, our subroutine. And that's more about what causes perpetual, in my case, cardiac disease in patients. Mom, dad, brother, so everybody's got the same stuff. Well, you all come from the same family. And so it's not just the genes. They play a part, I'm not saying they're not important, but we have a lot more control than we realize. It's not just your exposure and your life experience. It's your parents, your grandparents, and in some cases, even your great-grandparents. And we've seen this. There's something called the Dutch Famine Study that's one of the most amazing studies about this, back from the 1940s, where there was a, I can't remember now, roughly 30, 20, 30,000 people who were cut off by the Nazis and experienced like a 10 or 11 month famine. And the studies of those children, so there were women who were pregnant at that time, and they've actually broken it down into women who were in their last trimester and women in their first trimester. And the children of those women in different groups had different responses. And their children's children have different issues. Some struggle with obesity, some don't. And it all has to do with if you're in utero and your mother's experiencing a famine, it increases her stress hormones. And those children come out and they have craving for food and carbohydrates and other things that other people don't. Because they're like, they're coming out of the womb like, game on, I gotta find food. Because there wasn't any. 
And that happens through something we call methylation. Mark Wallen wrote a book called It Didn't Start With You is another one I give out to patients. This book's amazing. If you're half a science geek, you'll love it. I literally could have like just read the book to you and it would have been a great talk. And he talks about Rachel Yehuda, who's a researcher. Oh, where'd it go? Did I move it around? I did. So Rachel Yehuda is probably the top researcher in this area of trans family, transgenerational PTSD. And she was one of the first to show that trauma is actually passed on. And so what I tell my patients, I, I routinely see people in their 20s and 30s and they're struggling with massive anxiety and there seems to be nothing really in their history that would suggest that they're carrying some big trauma or issue that they themselves experience. But then you start asking, well, does your mom, yes, my mom has horrible anxiety and her mother, and okay, <laughs> well, here's how this works. Um, and what happens is, think about this for a second. The egg that became you, a little creepy, but the egg that became you was actually in your grandmother at one point. Because when your mother was formed as a fetus, she produces all the eggs she'll ever have. And so those experiences that your grandmother and then your mother experienced are actually transmitted because the eggs are bathed in the hormones and that changes the DNA. It causes something called methylation. So it either locks in a gene and says, you're not gonna turn on, or it locks in a gene and says, you are gonna turn on. Now we know today that we actually have some control over undoing that, but it takes work. And that goes back to this. For years, when I grew up in school, and most of you probably too, we thought 98% of DNA was junk. We didn't have any idea what it did. We we're like, okay, it doesn't code for hair color, eye color, height, weight, all those things that we think about when we think about DNA. Uh-huh, but there's something called non-coding DNA. And what we're realizing now is instead of being junk, that's actually the stuff that passes on kind of this collective family consciousness. It codes for a lot of our emotional, behavioral, personality traits that we inherit. And interestingly, the more complexity the organism, the higher the complexity, the more non-coding DNA we have. And it's affected, it's affected by toxins. This is where I say there's like 280 different chemicals now in women's breast milk in this country. It's affected by inadequate nutrition, like one in five children go hungry in this country, and stressful emotions. And usually the children that are in the stressful environments are probably getting more exposure to toxins and more inadequate nutrition. So down at the bottom, that war zone schoolyard, this is, again, the maladaption. So if a baby, if a mom grows up in Beirut and she gets pregnant and has a child and they move to America and they come to school here in Williamson County and the kid's in school and outside a truck backfires, that kid's going under the desk, whether he likes it or not, because that's been encoded into him. But in a school like in Williamson County, that's kind of not gonna be cool for that kid. That's a maladaptive response in that setting. And so you have to understand, these things are not bad. The body's doing what the body does to enable the survival of the species. It's looking at the biological environment in which it's being brought about and it's changing to adapt for it. The problem is, is those changes cause all the things we've talked about. They lead down the road. Once these things get turned on, it's like they're put in concrete. And so these kids are hypervigilant, they're anxious, and they're looking to fix that. And so they'll medicate in any way they can. That's why they have a higher use of drug use, alcohol, promiscuous behaviors, all those kind of things that happen as a way to kind of like, I'm hurting and I'm on and I know I need to kind of get settled and I don't know how to do it. This is also from the center. And this one down here in the middle, the two DNA strands, you can't really read it. But it says, when experiences during development rearrange the epigenetic marks that govern gene expression, they can change whether or how genes release the information they carry. So for instance, we may all carry a gene that causes cancer, but until the right context of environment and stress and other things turn on, that gene lays dormant, it doesn't get activated. But if our life experience is such, between environmental exposures and emotional behavior and all those kind of things, it can turn those genes on. So how do we start to fix this? That's my thing. 
I have to fix stuff. So I just recently, because I love refuse, like in order to be on the board, I have to take the Enneagram test, which I've done before, but it's been a while. And I took it just recently and I was a two, right? I was like 24, scored a 24 with a two, which is the helper. But I was 21 on both one, which is the reformer and three, which is the achiever. So I'm going to help you achieve by reforming you today, I guess. (laughs) So I'm always about trying to fix stuff because I think something's broken, there has to be a reason and I can fix it. And the truth is, Fixing's not the operative word. We can heal, but there'll always be scars. And my presence here today is God's story through me of redemption and the ability to take something that I thought was gonna be the end of my world and turn it into something that I never would have imagined. So what is trauma? You could have a lot of different definitions. Amy and I kind of talked about this before this slide went together. And I really like this one by Gabor Mate. He's one of my heroes. So in this guy's world, he's one of the leading trauma addiction guys in in the world. In his world, everybody with an autoimmune disease, cancer, heart disease, it's all trauma related. Not sure I agree to that extent, but that's his world. But his point is the point. When we're traumatized, we dissociate. And it's getting back to ourselves, which is our whole journey in life. We all in some way leave who we really are in order to survive in the family that we were raised in. And that's trauma. Whether we tell the truth about it or not. And it's that very separation from our emotions and our body. Bessel van der Kolk talks about that a lot. You know, he wrote The Body Keeps the Score and about how, and that's why we're gonna talk about movement and meditation and all those things later here. My job was to kind of set the stage for why this is even important. Why do we even talk about yoga and meditation and nutrition and all these things? And then Peter Levine, trauma is not what happens to us, but what we hold inside in the absence of an empathic witness. This is why refuge exists, right? A safe space to tell the truth of my heart. Not the truth that I think somebody wants to hear in church, right? There's a different truth there. But the things that I would never say in public or maybe in a church setting, but the things that are in me regardless that I need to be able to talk about. So trauma is is the dissociation of ourselves and healing is how do we reconnect and hence healing through connection. So we're made sick through relationship and we heal through relationship. Everything's relational if you're a human being, everything. We have to reconnect to ourselves, God and others. We tell the truth of our hearts. And again, that's not like the thing that you think the person wants to hear, but what's really true for you with safe people. So people who've been through this walk. And that gets us to attachment, which is secure versus insecure. Started being studied in the 1960s. So you can probably guess I have insecure attachment. It's getting better. And I have people in my life now that I have secure attachment with, but growing up, I never had that. And because I didn't have secure attachment, my body and brain were always in the on position, always. Hypervigilant all the time. Trying to anticipate everybody's move around me, trying to move around them, caretake them. We talk about the four S's with attachment. Seen, safe, secure, soothed. And the beauty of all this stuff, I'm almost wrapping up, is neuroplasticity, we can, we can change. So I wouldn't be talking about any of this if you're like, oh my gosh, like, This happened to me and so I'm broken. Yeah, I'm broken, very broken and healing. It's both. So Dan Allender at the uh, Seattle School of Counseling and Psychology, love him, love his stuff. He talks about the four requirements for secure attachment. We're almost done, it's my next to last slide, I think. So if you wanna take a picture, this is the one you wanna take home. 
So attunement is the ability to delight in another human being. My wife does this so well with our children. It's amazing to watch. They get the biggest grins. She is so playful with them. She does an amazing job with them. And for so long, I just couldn't bring myself to it. Like I did, but I, I wasn't really present. I carried so much shame. But the ability to delight in another human being, it's I resonate with you, I get you, I have empathy with you. I delight in your presence. Containment is about boundaries. How are we honored, our differences, how we approach life, what we wanna eat, what we wanna wear. It's not like, hey, carte blanche, do whatever you want. And it's not like, eh, you're gonna do exactly what I say all the time. It's, hey, like I respect it, you're this way and you're this way. And man, that's why we have children, right? Children raise us up. They're there to show us that we grew up with only one eye open. We have half the software we need to live a full life. And our children show us where all our wounds are. Mine do anyway. Repair is the ability to have humility to say, I messed up, I'm sorry, without the but. Man, I used to do it all the time. I'm sorry, but if you had just done this, I wouldn't have had to do this. Oh my goodness. That's a kid, right? Adult child. And consistency, and this is, this is crazy to me. It tells me a lot about my childhood, but all the parent has to be 50%. You get 50% of this and you're golden. We are so resistant to harm. And so what that says is when you see somebody who is struggling with something like I talked about earlier, you have to realize that those who have insecure attachment had a significant amount of neglect, trauma, abuse. They wouldn't be that way. And then last slide. So the studies are showing that this can be changed. We can heal. We can do the things that we need to do in order to be whole again to get back in touch with who we really are before everything changed. It's play, acceptance. Gosh, do I have to work on that one a lot? Curiosity about ourselves and others and empathy. So that's it. Oh, where's my next slide? There it is. So if you have an interest these are four books that I would definitely look at reading. They're all great for different reasons. And I give a lot of these out to patients. They're like, you're a cardiologist. You're supposed to prescribe me a blood pressure medicine and a cholesterol pill. I am. And we have to look at these other things too. Because it's not just this. But if we don't have the eyes to see and the ears to hear, we'll miss it. And it's so important that we treat the heart, the mind, and the body because they're inseparable. You cannot talk about mind-body connection. There is no such thing. They are the same. The brain, the mind, the body, any of you who have dealt with trauma, you know you can store things in your body. Like this thing's nagging at me. Well, it's not anything physical. It's actually where you store this memory. So, all right. I'm gonna walk off and think, gosh, there's 20 things I wish that talked about. <laughs> but my hope is that you'll realize as you leave here, like there's more to my story and there's more to other people's stories. And the last thing I'll say, everybody's doing the best they can with where they are today. And that's grace. Thanks. Thanks Amy. So Thomas, I just want to say to you that we see you. That was awesome. And it took a lot of courage to come up here and do that. And um, God has a lot in store for you with what you have to share. So... I want to welcome Sandra Hatcher up to the stage. Sandra is our board treasurer, and she has a couple of things she'd like to share with you before our next speaker. I'll give you the podium. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Continuing with our theme today, I'd like to share a little bit about my connection to the Refuge Center for Counseling, and then ask you to consider starting or deepening your connection. 
In early 2006, I traveled from Southern California to Nashville to visit my son, daughter-in-law, and my three adorable granddaughters. A job transfer had brought them here from Miami, and they were still in the process of moving, so it was just to be a visit. But something happened, a strange attraction to this bewitching southern town, and did I say my three adorable granddaughters were here? And before I knew it, I was moving to Nashville. I was very thankful for the proximity to family because I was also in the process of working through some very serious life issues at that time. It was a time of transitions, changes, but also sorting lies from truth in my mind, of healing from an extended period of stress on my body, and allowing God to calm and renew my spirit. You could say that at that period in my life, I was out of alignment and I was taking a holistic approach to intentionally restoring integrity and congruency to my mind, my body, and my heart. I really like those words. Alignment, holistic, intentional, integrity, congruent. Those are words that are also deeply embedded in refuge culture. So when I was introduced to the Refuge Center, there was a natural attraction right away to the mission and the work. I've watched the values of refuge being lived out. I've enjoyed personal relationships with some of the therapists and the staff. I've supported fundraising, and I've shared the refuge story with just about anybody who will listen. In my professional life, I spent over 25 years as a financial planner. So financial congruency and financial integrity have long been key issues for me. So being asked to serve on the board and then as treasurer of refuge was both a blessing and an honor because it allowed me to contribute in my areas of passion and belief. It's my pleasure today to ask you to consider four ways that you can make a connection to mission, to the mission of refuge, and ways that would be congruent with your passions and your beliefs. Number one, you could make a virtual connection. Just go to our website. You'll find ways to volunteer, to hear stories of hope and healing from some of our clients. You can stay updated on activities and events and follow us on social media and learn other ways that you can get connected. Two, you can make a physical connection. Be our guest. On the first three Tuesdays of every month from 12 to 1, we offer what we call a connections lunch. It's an opportunity for you to tour the facility, meet some of our therapists and staff, learn more about our programs and services, and for us to get to know you too over a meal. We would love to have you do that. Go to the website again and register for one of our connections lunches. Three, make a financial connection. Because we believe that everyone, regardless of economics and income, should have access to high quality counseling, we offer our services on a sliding scale. 91% of refuge clients receive this sliding scale benefit. In 2018, the average fee per session was $53. It cost refuge $81 to provide counseling services. That leaves a gap of nearly $30 per session. Will you consider standing in the gap? Please join our incredible group of donors who help us reach our annual budget and also provide opportunities for outreach programs like this. And for those of you who did make a donation when you registered today, thank you so very much. If you would consider becoming an ongoing supporter or making a one-time donation to Refuge, you may text the amount, go to our website, or if you're old school like me, reach in your purse or pocket, pull out that checkbook or some cash, put it in an envelope that's on the table, and leave it in the donation box that's at the table as you go out. Fourth, you could make a personal connection. If there's someone who comes to your mind today, someone who was not here and you think that they could benefit from what you're hearing, why don't you call them, text them, send a note, or at least pray for them. Make a personal connection. We all need that, sometimes giving one and sometimes receiving. Thank you.
Thank you, Sandra. So the order of events today was very intentional. And I want to introduce you to Kate Moyer. She's a mindfulness expert and has been the founder of the ABCs of Happy. And so we've been in our head a lot this morning. We've learned a lot, a lot of details and facts. And now we're going to sink down into our bodies a little bit and do some of our own healing work. So Kate, welcome. Good morning. Um, I'm so, so grateful to be here. And um, Dr. Thomas pretty much gave my speech. So uh, <laughs> we'll see where this goes. Um, I'm so grateful for such a wonderful foundation that was set. Um, so my apologies if some of the things I say uh, are repeated, but maybe that would be the second time that it really kind of gets in there. So. Um, did anyone, when you were a kid, play or have heard of freeze tag? Right? You run around? All right, cool. We're going to play freeze tag. Everyone stand up. Let's run around the room. Just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Might be a little chaotic, um, but we're going to play my variation of freeze tag. So three, two, one, freeze. Oh, that was awesome. People in the back, they were like, yeah. <laughs> um, breathe while you freeze, okay? But I want you just to kind of Notice if you are leaning in your chair one side more than you are a little on the other. Are you sitting a little more on your left or your right sit bone, right? And then is one leg crossed over the other? And if so, which one is it? It's probably the one that you cross the most. Now there are some of us who are double crossers. I mean, like double leg crossers, you know, yeah, you know what I meant. Um, and then real quick, just kind of notice if there's any tension, neck, shoulders, jaw, yeah? Okay, unfreeze, you did great, game over. Um, so why, why is that important, right? Because we have patterns in our body. So if you're willing, um, I gotta put my cards in my pocket. Um, would you interlace your hands and just kind of give a little stretch to your palms, your fingers? You're welcome to stretch your arms out if that feels good. Yeah? Ah, oh, nice. Okay, cool. Keep the inner lace, bring it in, and look down. Which index finger is closest to you? Okay, mine's my left. So undo the fingers, redo them with the opposite index finger closest to you. <laughs> I know, I'm really making you think. This is like a mind game, right? Does, does that make sense? Already it's weird, right? People are like, why? What, what is this? Okay, press. Doesn't that feel weird? Right? Why? Doesn't it feel tight, maybe? Like, this is like, oh, okay, that's normal. The, the other way is, okay, great. You guys are doing amazing. Okay, so that right there proves we have unconscious patterns in the body. Like when, when I said interlace your hands, you didn't think about it, bam, right? But what happens is, and that's a simple one, right? So you do that over and over and over and over, and what happens is one side of the palm, one side of the hand is stretched more than the other, right? So these unconscious patterns in the body, what happens is wear and tear over time, there starts to be a breakdown. So let me give you one of mine. Um, until I went through yoga therapy program uh, training, I didn't know I was a knee locker. <laughs> um, no one called me a knee locker. That's not like a bad, you know, you're a knee locker. Um, but I had pain in my knees, right? And I thought like, oh, maybe it just runs in the family. Well, in yoga therapy training, <laughs> it was really not fun. You had to get up and the whole class stared at you <laughs> to look at structural imbalances. So. I didn't know this, but I was hyperextending my knees for, you know, 30 years. And, and I knew I had pain, but, but I didn't know why. So that was an unconscious pattern in my body. And, and here's why that matters, is because again, wear and tear over time and then pain. So we don't realize that we have these unconscious patterns in our body until pain. Pain is the alert system. Right? Um, so we're gonna kind of get back to that. This is a little bit of a repeat. The mind and the body 
are interconnected, right? One affects the other. So let's take my knee pain, for example. Okay, that's a physical issue, right? It's, it's a physical pain, yet it is also creating mental pain because I wake up in the morning and my knee hurts and I go, oh man, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to like walk my dog for a long walk today. Ah, oh, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to do that yoga posture where I'm on my knee. Like, oh, it's such a bummer. And then if I really am honest, like let me be honest, I'm like, how, when is this gonna get better? Am I gonna have to have surgery? Right, so all of a sudden a physical pain is affecting me mentally, right? Okay, let's, let's flip-flop that. So, and this was so brilliantly already discussed, but you know, just, just let me <laughs> stick to some of my speech. Um, so, <laughs> so uh, the mind also has patterns, right? And a lot of those are also unconscious. We're not aware of them. So I have, a, a, let's say, a pattern of worry. Okay, and I'm just constantly, constantly, constantly. And I might be a little bit aware of it, but it's in the background, like white noise, kind of just all the time. And so remember, wear and tear over time, now I have stomach issues, now I have headaches, I'm grinding my teeth at night, right? And, and so on and so forth. So why, why is this important? Because the mind and the body um, coming together has a lot to teach us, has a lot to inform us. Um, and how can we find healing through this mind-body connection? Like, why does it matter? Um, just because, you know, the, the connection we kind of talked about for the negative, right? Like, my, my knee has pain and then my mind has pain. Um, it actually can be used for the positive, right? We can actually begin to heal some of that chronic worry or that fear um, through the body, and I don't want to get too off topic because I love this, I geek out about this, um, but that's really through the nervous system. So it was mentioned that fight, flight, freeze, that chronic stress, that um, you know, tension physically, mentally. So that's the sympathetic nervous system, right? That's, that's activated. And we have this amazing, amazing healing um, quality in, in our nervous system. It's, it's the other branch. You have your um, autonomic and then you have your sympathetic and your parasympathetic, right? And the parasympathetic is, you know, often termed as the rest and digest. So that's where it's the opposite of stress. It helps everything to slow down, right? Digestion increases. Um, all that tension in the body can let go. And um, we do that diaphragmatic breathing and it actually brings the body back down to a place of calm. And when we're calm, um, it feels really great, right? There's not so much stress on the organs and the tissues and there's so many different effects. But here's, here's the, the wonderful news, is that calm in the body positively affects the mind. Right? Anxiety tends to have a lot of physical symptoms as well as mental symptoms, right? We'll hear racing heart, sweating, um, you know, so forth, so on and so forth. But then racing thoughts. So I wasn't, I wasn't, I gotta look at my time. I wasn't gonna talk about this, but this is one of my, my favorite things, and I'm, I'm so hoping I get my information correct. So Dan Siegel is, um, so amazing, he's a psychologist, and he came up with this um, little model, and I talk about this and teach this over and over and over, because I think this is just so powerful. So he, he calls it the hand model. So he says, this is the brainstem, okay? And then this is the limbic system, which Dr. Thomas was talking about. And then this, okay, is the prefrontal cortex, which was also mentioned. So that is, you know, the ability to um, have perspective, to make a decision, which when we're stressed, right, when we're in that emotional regulation place, that doesn't go well, right? And yet we still try to do it. So, so the practice today, hopefully, in the body is get calm first and then go ahead and, and do, you know, whatever conversation you have to have. Okay, so back to this. When we get stressed, okay, when we get triggered, when trauma is activated, he says we flip our lid. 
really, which I think is so genius. But basically, the limbic system is in charge. And again, that's all that emotion, and we're freaking out, and we might say some things we don't really mean. That's where, you know, um, violence comes from, because we're just very reactive. So what does that have to do with yoga? What does that have to do with the body? Is again, you're, if your lid is flipped, you can't make that higher functioning decision making of the brain. So how do, how do you unflip it? You have to calm the nervous system. Right? You have to kind of use the body, use that diaphragmatic breathing, get back to a calm place, and then that higher function in the brain comes back on. So, if you're willing, would you do just a little, because we only have a, a, a little bit of time, would you do a practice with me, just to kind of check that out? So, um, like Amy mentioned, you do whatever is most comfortable for you in your body. But I thought instead of me talking about this, we could hopefully experience it a little. Yeah? Woo! Yeah! <laughs> Thank you. That was more for me. Um, okay, so if you're willing, you can close your eyes and just kind of really sit in your chair. You're like, duh, I am sitting in my chair. <laughs> like, let yourself like your seat get a little heavier, let your spine kind of lean back. And then just take a nice easy breath in, an easy breath out. Okay, then just kind of check in. The level of stress in your physical body, right? And maybe just how present your mind feels. Do you feel like you're all over the place or are you really here, or are you really present? And we're not gonna share this out loud with anyone, so don't get nervous. So on a scale from one to 10, with one, I feel very relaxed, I feel very present. And 10, I feel really, really tense, right? There's a lot of physical tension, I feel very distracted. Real quick, just where would you put yourself on that scale? Just quietly to yourself. Okay, one, I'm really chill, calm, relaxed. 10, I feel really stressed. Awesome. So you can open your eyes and want you to take just a nice easy breath in. And as you exhale, let your head turn to the left. Give a little stretch in your neck. And as you inhale, bring your head back to center and exhale, turn to the other side. Just nice and easy, gentle stretch, okay? Inhale, bring the head back to center. Exhale, give a little tuck of the chin down. And then inhale, roll it over to one collarbone. And exhale, bring it back down through center. Inhale, roll it over to the other collarbone. Just as much as feels good to you. Exhale, bring it back down to center. Inhale, lift the head and lift the shoulders. Give a little shrug of the shoulders up. And then exhale, let them relax and release. And if you're good, we're gonna do that two more times. So your inhale, just shrug the shoulders up. And then as you exhale, not only drop the shoulders, not only breathe out, but imagine whatever tension is there, maybe hidden, collected, is letting go. Do one more for good measure, right? Just that stress that the body is holding that you didn't even know, it's leaving through your breath, right? Through this attention to the muscles, giving the body permission to let go. So as long as it's okay, go ahead and stretch up through your right arm. Just give a nice length through the side body. Exhale, let that go. Yeah, doing good. And inhale the other. You can lean if that feels good, just what feels good to you. And exhale, good. So be mindful of who's around you if you're like real you know, close in. We're gonna do just a gentle twist and it needs to feel good. So just sit up nice and tall. And then as you exhale, spin kind of from your belly button. Do a little turn to the right. You can do whatever you want with your hands. You know, a hand across, just whatever feels good. Inhale, come on back to center. Sit up nice and tall, lots of space between the vertebra. And then exhale, easy little twist over to the other side. And again, make sure it feels good. Inhale, come on back to center. And then again, be mindful of your neighbors. Lean a little bit to one side. Yeah, and then I'll come back to center and lean a little bit to the other side. And inhale, come back to center. Let's take a little pause. Are you noticing tension in the body that maybe you didn't even know was there? Is one side tighter than the other? 
right? So we don't, we don't pay attention to that. And the, the stress response on the body, like was mentioned, is for all the muscles to get really, really tight and actually turn in, right? It turns in on itself. So by using the body to loosen, to open, to, to get some more room and space, it's countering the stress response. It's telling the body that, oh, we don't have to be um, in this fight, flight, or freeze. What is so fascinating is another symptom of fight, flight, and freeze is the eyes. They get really, really big and they go forward, right? Because it's the eyes are, the body's scanning for danger. So again, if you're willing, can I have you close your eyes? Only if that's comfortable for you. And I want you to take three breaths, and what I'd like for you to do is try to feel the eyes move back and down. And that might feel helpful as you exhale. Like, feel the eyes get real heavy, feel all the muscles across the eyebrows and the temples and the inner and outer corners of the eyes soften. And the reason being is this is telling the body that you're not in a stress response, right? You're actually moving into that parasympathetic response, relaxed, calm, present. And then as long as it's okay, if your eyes are still closed or open, whatever feels better, could you just take a nice easy breath in, give a little pause at the top, just like a second, and then breathe out. And see if you can like empty your lungs all the way. You can breathe out of your nose or out of your mouth, whatever feels better for you. And may I invite you to try that two more times. So a normal inhale in, don't be <laughs> So little pause at the top, and then a bit of a longer exhale out. And just see how that feels. One more if that's all right. The body is softening. Again, that stress, that unconscious tension is leaving. Awesome job. And then see if you can let the body just feel a little heavier. Heavier in the seat, the arms heavier, the hands heavier. And then go back to that little scale and see what the level of tension and stress is in the body now, in the mind now. You know, one, calm, chill, present. 10, a little more stressed. All right. And then I want to invite you to open your eyes if your eyes were closed. So it was a real small practice, right? Um, but just attending to the body, just bringing the mind into the present moment is so powerful. Because the stress response, again, typically, the mind is focused on the future or the past. Like if you really think about that, um, when you're stressed, when you're worried, even when you're in that hypervigilant place, you're, you're not really present, right? You're scanning, you're thinking, or you're worrying, I shouldn't have said that. And so just that simple exercise that we just did um, was, is really beautiful because we, we brought a lot of things together. Not only did we invite ourselves to be present, right? But we also use the physical movement, right? To kind of get rid of some of the, the, the stress and tension that was being maybe housed in, in the body. But then we did that breathing exercise. And again, the breath is such a powerful tool to help engage that parasympathetic nervous system, that natural calming um, ability of the body by elongating the exhale. So if you need to calm you want a longer exhale, right? Did anyone's numbers change even just a little bit? Yeah, a couple. So um, this practice of learning to come into the body, again, is so important because it really is a map and a guide to our healing. Um, you know, the book was mentioned, The Body Keeps the Score, and that is so true. I mean, when I went through training, my, my teacher was a little more cheesy. She said, the issues are in the tissues. All right? Isn't that good? <laughs> um, but what happens is through trauma, through, um, you know, chronic stress, that emotional residue is in the body. 
And, you know, I have my own story. I come from a pretty intense background with a lot of complex trauma. And I have been in therapy pretty much my uh, adult life, and, and I believe in it. I support it. That's why I'm here. I think, I think, oh, my gosh, we need it. I learned so much about my family and the patterns and what happened. Um, but what was interesting is I would tell my story you know, to these wonderful, um, talented therapists, and, and they would cry. And I'd be like, okay, yeah, that was like really annoying, let's move on, okay? So because I, I went through that, I got really disconnected from my body, right? I didn't want to feel. Um, I could tell the story over and over and over and over and over, and I wouldn't have any type of like connection until, <laughs> I took my first yoga class. Never heard of yoga in my entire life. Apparently grew up, to, grew up in a box um, and didn't know what it was. And I was like, cool, I'll do it. And I, I was a dancer. So I went into this class and it felt like dance to me. And I was like, oh, this is awesome. Yeah, we're moving, we're flowing. Yeah, I'm flexible, this is great. Um, and then, you know, if you've ever taken a yoga class, the last pose is Shavasana. So I'm just looking around, people are like dropping on the floor, you know, the lights are going down, music is going up, I'm like, it's about to get weird, what is happening, you know? And um, yeah, we were asked to lie on the floor and be perfectly still. And now, many years later looking back, I think that was probably my first panic attack. And because the way that I dealt, the way that I coped is I just stayed busy. Right? I was a hustler. I just moved, I just went, I went. And I really feel like that was probably the first time in my life that I was still. And everything collected in my body and was waiting for me. Right? So another cheesy statement for you. You ready? <laughs> um, I don't know where this came from. I'm, maybe I made it up, I don't, probably not. But we have to feel so we can deal, so we can heal. Right, and that's what yoga really did for me. Everything that I didn't want to feel, everything that uh, I didn't want to notice was in my body. And, and that is so powerful, because again, remember, um, one affects the other for the negative, but also for the positive. So when I could feel that you know, tightness in my chest now, I, I put my hand over my heart and I attend to it. That's a mindfulness tool and technique. It's called attend and befriend, right? Where before I'd be like, ooh, this is horrible. I gotta do some laundry. <laughs> um, I, I started a yoga therapy program at um, Foundations Recovery Network, so I work with a lot of people in recovery. And I mean, it's a powerful thing to, to give people another option, another way to cope. So we only have a few minutes left. I wanna invite you, um, into one more little practice with me, um, and that is um, a meditation. And why meditation, oh, I just go on and on, is so uh, powerful. I mean, research is showing it literally is changing the gray matter in the brain. Um, so some, just from a scientific standpoint, I mean, it's, it's really creating a, a lot of positive change. Um, but again, meditation invites us to come into the moment, right, because, uh, the stress response, we like to be all over the place. We want to be in the future. And then, you know, what I shared, we don't want to deal. We don't want to feel. So when you have to sit and you have to kind of learn to train your mind to be in the moment, again, eventually you'll start to see the patterns of the mind. You'll start to see, oh, there I go again, right? Oh, there's that worry response. So... <laughs> Who wants to sit and watch their worry response? Yay! <laughs> no, we're not gonna do that. Um, but can we do just like a one minute little mindfulness meditation? So again, get comfortable. You're welcome to close your eyes. Please don't feel like you have to. I'm gonna invite you to just take a nice easy breath in. Easy breath out. And take a moment and just listen and see if you can pick up any sounds in the room. What do you notice? And then how does your breath feel? Like you don't need to breathe in any particular way, just how does it feel? 
And then what sensations are you aware of in your body? Positive, negative, somewhere in between, just what do you notice? And then as if you were kind of just watching a movie on a screen, where, where are your thoughts? Right, and this isn't to judge, it's just information. We're just noticing. Good. Can you feel your feet? Can you feel your legs, just the sense of grounding? I invite you to take a slow breath in and out. And then nice and easy, you can open your eyes and bring yourself back into the room. So, I mean, it's a tiny, tiny little practice, but why that is so important, again, it helps the mind be more focused. But this is one thing I love about meditation. We talked about patterns in the body and patterns in the mind. When you can see the patterns in the mind, there's this um, mindfulness technique called non-identify. You can begin to go, I, I'm, not, I'm not broken, I'm experiencing anxiety, right? That's my experience. Or, I, I'm not a worrier. This is a, a pattern that I'm noticing. So you take whatever it is you're struggling with, right? Because we all struggle. And you pull it apart from who you are. And you watch the pattern at play, but you also still get to be you. Beautiful, wonderful, incredible you. And these things, these mind habits, that's all they are. And I really think that's where true healing and connection come in, the mind and the body, and then com coming back to your true, real, authentic self. Thank you all so, so much for your time. Good, huh? Feeling a little more relaxed? All right, again, be taking care of yourself. Feel free to refill on water, drinks, restroom breaks, whatever you need. Um, next, we have Dr. Summer White, who is in functional medicine, and she is going to give us a fascinating presentation. We're all gonna learn a lot. I've seen these slides, they're fascinating, so. I'm sort of scanning the room for her. Let's see. Hi. Good. Come on up. <laughs> okay, great. Thanks. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Okay, hello everyone. So, um, I just want to say thank you that to Amy and um the Refuge Center for inviting me. This has been a great event already and I'm learning so much. So, I'm really excited to be here. And um, here's my slides up there. Um, so we're gonna talk today about the microbiome and intestinal health, one of my very, very favorite topics. Um, what I do is I practice functional medicine, integrative medicine, so it's a holistic practice. And um, thank you. Um, my specialty is actually digestive issues. So irritable bowel syndrome, um, inflammatory bowel conditions like ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. So this is, this is a really fun topic for me and um, I hope you'll learn a lot from it. Um, you know, one of the things that I do and one of the things that we're learning today is that we can change our condition. And I think that's very important to let people know that we can change it. And we can change the state of our, our health and what's going on inside of us. One of the first pe people that I worked with, I was formerly an emergency physician and um, before I got into functional medicine and I'm really happy that I discovered functional medicine because it pulled me out of that, which was actually my toxic environment. But one of the first people that I worked with was actually um, a, colleague's, um, a, a colleague's son. 
and his wife called me and said, um, you know, my son was just diagnosed with autism. And she was describing some of the things that were happening with him. And she said, can we change this? And I was relatively new to functional medicine and I had already done some studying and I said, yes, we can change this condition. And I believed that we could and she believed that we could. So we started working together and she went to the Amen Clinic, which specializes in brain, brain health. And she started being a little Dr. Google and doing her own research. And over the course of the next two years, we worked together, we changed his diet, we started healing his gut, and he is now off the spectrum. And very powerful that what I do is I help people to realize that they can heal. You can heal and you can change your condition. So what we're gonna do today, I'm gonna show you a little way, a few ways how to do that and how we can move forward in our health. So let's start with the intestines because that's really what we're gonna focus on today is intestinal health. You know, Dr. Blazer said in 2014, this was an article um, out of a medical journal, he said, it's reasonable to propose that the composition of the microbiome and its activities are involved in most, if not all, of the biological processes that constitute human health and disease. Most, if not all. And I think now we're going towards all. It plays a major role in health and what goes on with our nervous system, with our immune system, um, with our mental health, and that's what we'll look at today. Okay, oops. So, we're gonna talk about the microbiome, but let's look at first about what is healthy digestion. So, one of the questions that I ask my patients when they first see me is, what's your digestion like? Because let's see if there's an imbalance, let's see where, what could be contributing. And so we look at what does a healthy digestion look like? And when you think about digestion, you think about anything from the mouth to the bottom. So how many, first, how many bowel movements are you having? And we really wanna have one to two bowel movements a day. If you're having too many, if they're loose, then you may not be digesting well, you may not be absorbing well. If you're not having any, that's a major problem too. So one to two soft bowel movements a day. Are you bloating? Bloating's a sign there's an imbalance, so we really don't want bloating. Bloating that could come at the beginning of the meal or right after the meal could mean you're might not making enough stomach acid. Bloating that comes a little later could mean that you have food sensitivities. So are you bloating? Where, where is it coming from? Um, is there abdominal pain there? Healthy digestion shouldn't have any abdominal pain. Uh, what are your stools look like? Are they soft? Are they formed? Are they hard? Um, are they hard, and hard to get out? Are they dry? Um, is there blood or mucus in there? Are you seeing bits of food? You know, all these things can mean there's inflammation. Maybe you're not digesting your food well. Maybe you're just not taking the time to chew. Um, and then one of the things that can be a helpful way to look at the stools. What does it actually look like? So I consider putting like real, real pictures in here, but I, I went with this version. So. <laughs> um, so, you know, some people don't always like to talk about their poop, but you know, I, every day this is, it's really an important part of health. And what does it look like, you know? Um, and, and it's funny, kids too, they, they, they sometimes, they, they, I, well, I don't, I don't look at it. I, I, don't, I don't look at that yet. So, um, so what, what I do is we, we can look at this chart to see. And if you see type three and type four, those are actually fairly healthy um, bowel movements. What should they look like? So you want the bowels, it, it should come out easily. It should be formed. Really you want one piece, like soft, like a soft serve ice cream or it goes right down in the, into the toilet. Um, 
it can have it can have little fissures in the side of it um, but you don't you don't really want to have chunks right you don't want to have you don't want to have hard dry chunks because that could mean that the stool's too dry then maybe you're not having enough fiber you're not staying hydrated uh, maybe you're you're not moving things through well. And a big problem that I see with um, irritable bowel syndrome is they have very slow transit times. So the time that it goes from the stomach until the bottom, it doesn't. It, they're, it, they're very slow, and it, and that's a stress that can be a stress response. But the stool over time, the longer it stays in the intestines, it gets very dry. The water keeps getting sucked out of it, and so it gets very hot, hard and dry. So and some people will say they're like little rabbit pellets where they're very hard and dry. So that that's that would be more type one. As the stool gets looser then it starts to fall apart. And so it doesn't, it doesn't hold together well. So if you're having a bowel movement and you notice it hits the water and it just falls apart, then um, that means your stool's a little too loose. Sometimes it never even is, it's just mush and it all comes out and it's like water, more like on the diarrhea stage. So that would be more type seven. Um, and you know, a lot of people vary go between constipation and diarrhea, um, that type of thing. So, but always important to look at this. I had, um, there was a girl in my office the other day and we were talking about her stools and nobody really realized that she was having abnormal stools, but based on her presentation, I thought, she, something's going on with her digestion. I said, what are your stools doing? She's like, oh, I, I go to the bathroom every day. And I said, well, what happens when your poop hits the water? Does it stay together or does it fall apart? She said, oh, it falls apart. And then the mom's like, okay, so maybe something is going on here. So one of the most important things when we're looking at the stool and we're looking at intestinal health is to look at our microbiome. So this has been um, you know, a hot topic in the last few years and because we're learning how important it is to overall health. But the microbiome, it's the bacteria in the gut. Now, if you think about your stool volume, 30% of it is bacteria. Usually dead, but it's bacteria. Um, so there's over 100 trillion different types of bacteria in the gut. Everybody has a different microbiome, though very similar to um, people in your family. Um, total weight of the microbiome is about two to five pounds. So all this bacteria and its material is about two to five pounds, that, that's a lot. You know, I, I like to say that it's, it's its own organ and we're really treating it like that. So we're gonna feed it, we're gonna nurture it, we're gonna treat it like it's something that really is functioning like your heart and your kidney and, and your lungs and your brain, you're gonna nurture it. So, and we do all that because we know that there are so many different functions of this microbiome. One of the main things that we're gonna get into today is the production of neurotransmitters, things like serotonin. 90%, up to 90% of serotonin is made in your gut. And so if that bacteria is not healthy, you may not be making that, that serotonin. And you know, um, conditions like depression are associated with low serotonin production. Vitamin synth synthesis, things like vitamin B12, vi biotin, and vitamin K, all produced in the gut. 70% um, of your immune system is in the gut. So if there are immune problems or immune dysregulation, that can start with gut and intestinal problems. It also provides a barrier from the outside world. So really, if you think about your, your gut, it's a, it's a long tube. And, and really it's exposed to the external environment. And so it's this bacteria that, that kind of funnel out everything and keep that from entering your body. Now when the gut becomes dysfunctional, that you can get gaps in your cells and things that are not supposed to go into your body start to go into your body. But if you're healthy, back, if you have healthy bacteria, they prevent this from happening. So they're really guard, they're like your guardians, the guardians from the outside world. 
and they protect us not only from toxins, environmental toxins, they bind to things like heavy metals. They also keep protect us from harmful bacteria, from parasites, from yeast, and they help us to digest our food. They actually secrete enzymes. They carry different genes in and, in and of themselves that help to secrete and produce different enzymes to break down the food. So let's talk a little bit about how this bacteria affects our mood and our stress response, which we've heard so much about today, which is, is really an important um, factor. And we know that this gut-brain connection is really more than just that. It affects the entire body, like Dr. Thomas said. It's the in entire body mounting a response and having a connection with each other. In holistic medicine, that's really what we do is we look at the body as a whole. How is it connecting? How is it making these, these webs to have responses all together? And we know that, this, that the bacteria themselves actually play a major role in how we respond to stress. So when some of the first studies, or a lot of the studies that look at stress responses were actually done in germ-free mice. So these are mice that they were incubated and grown up in an environment where they don't have intestinal bacteria. So lack of bacteria. So what happens is they take these mice and then they put them into a stressful environment. Now for a mice, mouse, and there were a lot of different studies looking at germ-free mice. Some of them put them in a tube and they confined them there for hours at a time. Some of them put them on a treadmill and made, or um, one of those little wheels and made them run and mount a physical stress response like that. And then they compared those mice without intestinal bacteria to the mice that had healthy intestinal bacteria. By and large, the, the mice that were germ-free had heightened stress responses. Their cortisol and adrenaline was much higher, three to four-fold higher than the mice that had intestinal, good, healthy bacteria. So then what they did, did is they repopulated their guts. So they gave them good bacteria, things like lactobacillus and bifidobacterium. And they fed them bacteria and they healed their guts. And then they did the same study and their stress response resolved. So it came down and it came down to normal. So how can we take this and relate it to what's going on with our health? So one of the things that we can do when we're healing from stress and trauma is to heal our guts and heal and get this bacteria back into balance. When it's imbalanced, we call it dysbiosis or that imbalance, and it can be an imbalance of not just bacteria, can be yeast, can be parasites. You know, a quarter of the people um, of the population have some sort of parasite. I see it every day in my practice. We let, look at their stool, we find there's a parasite. Um, you know, it doesn't have to, dis, the dysbiosis doesn't necessarily have to be in the gut. You can also have dysbiosis in your skin, in the vagina, in your teeth, in your mouth. You know, now we're learning so much that our body isn't as once sterile as we thought it was, that now we're learning there's a microbiome in the brain. So, very important. Um, so what happens, what, why do we get imbalanced and, and how, does it, how does it happen? Um, you know, a lot of times if you are born via vaginal delivery, you get your microbiome, it starts from your mother. So if your mother um, has IBS or some autoimmune conditions or things that are associated with a weakened microbiome, you're gonna get, you're gonna inherit hers. So that starts, if you're breastfed, it's different than if you're nursed. Um, 
if you've had antibiotics, that affects the bacteria, decreases the overall diversity of the bacteria. If you are on medication such as antacids like proton pump inhibitors, like Nexium and Prilosec, those types of medications, causes your body not to uh, digest the food well. Lack of chewing, the same thing. You're not able to digest the food well. We're learning that those undigested food particles are actually causing growth of unhealthy bacteria in the gut. Chronic constipation, where things just sit there and ferment, then feed the unhealthy bacteria. So when you look at your gut, you look at healthy and helpful bacteria versus not so helpful bacteria, right? How do emotions play? So when you have an emotion of stress, fear, or anger, those emotions suppress your your healthy bacteria, things like lactobacillus and bifidobacterium. They also cause the growth of not so helpful bacteria. They also, stress responses like catecholamines, things like adrenaline also stimulate the growth of unhealthy bacteria. So I kind of look at this as a way of if you've been exposed, which we all have to these types of emotions, you've had these emotions before, it's like giving yourself internal food poisoning, right? Because that emotion is triggering this growth of bacteria that's not helpful, you're gonna get diarrhea. So it can be the same as taking it by mouth. So if you go and get food poisoning, you're injecting, ingesting a bacteria or virus that's not helpful, gives you vomiting and diarrhea. So what happens with dysbiosis or this imbalance of bacteria? One of the main things that happens is inflammation. Inflammation in the gut. And I see this in stool tests that I, that I prescribe on people. We look at inflammation markers. But what happens is, is this inflammation affects your hormones, affects your neurotransmitters. Inflammation in the gut equals inflammation in the brain. So if we can calm inflammation in the gut, we can support inflammation in the brain. We know that depression is an inflammatory process. And so when we look at nutrition, we look at anti-inflammatory foods to decrease overall health inflammation. But many studies show that inflammatory markers that we can actually measure in the blood are higher in um, people with depression. So what is this gut-brain connection? Um, you know, your gut has its own nervous system. So it's called the enteric nervous system. So does anybody, has anybody have an, ever had a nervous stomach before? Yeah, that's your enteric nervous system. And I really like what Amy said when she asked the question, how do you feel? How do you feel in your head? How do you feel in your heart? And how do you feel in your gut, in your stomach, right? That nervous system plays a role. And we know that it's, it's responding, it's influencing what's happening in the brain because it produces your neurotransmitters. So that serotonin that it's producing, you know what modulates that is those little bacteria. They're like the little gatekeepers. And they say, okay, you can make it and you can release it. So they play a role in both. And it's that healthy bacteria that allows the body to make and release it. It's connected physically by the vagus nerve. So everything we've done today that talks about the parasympathetic state, everything that Kate went through, that's activating your, your vagus nerve. And, but you know, we're, we know more and more that this connection, it's not really just that. It's involved in mul multiple different um, systems as well. And adrenal glands are a major part. If, if anybody's heard of the adrenal glands, they sit above your kidneys. They're little tiny organs. They secrete your cortisol and your, your epinephrine. And they play a major role in this gut-brain axis too. So it's really more than the gut-brain axis, just like most things we talk about. It's the whole body. 
So this is just a picture overall about the gut-brain connection, how it goes both ways. And so when you're working on the gut, you work on the brain. And when you're working on the brain, you work on the gut. They go both ways. So I'm just gonna mention this briefly because I'm kind of running out of time, but IBS, you know, it's a syndrome, it's really a, a gut-brain access disorder. So when I work with patients with IBD, with IBS, um, there's so much literature on this about how the way this dysbiosis contributes to IBS. And I think in Western medicine, um, we're not, we call it a functional disorder because we really don't know what's causing it. And in functional medicine, we believe that it's this dysbiosis, this abnormal bacteria and the digestion that comes. And that's how, that's how we work to uh, resolve it. So how do we treat? How do we heal our guts? Um, you know, this is a very common um, saying by Hipp Hipp Hippocrates, let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. And really, the best way to heal your gut is to heal through diet. A healthy microbiome has diversity, a lot of different kinds of bacteria. It has diversity in a good number. The more food, different types of food you eat, the more different types of bacteria you're going to feed and grow. So the number one thing you can do to support your gut health is to eat a, different, a whole different variety of foods. So plants, plant food by and large feeds it the most. So lots and lots of fruits and vegetables. I tell my patients to have seven to 10 servings of fruits and vegetables today, a day and a large variety. So different colors of fruits and vegetable. You're, you want your plate to be very colorful, lots, you know, reds and yellows and greens. Green's probably my favorite one. Leafy greens, dark leafy greens. Things like kale and collards and bok choy. And you're eating them. And you prepare them different ways. So color and diversity. Adding fermented foods is, an, is another thing that can really change gut health. My favorite fermented food is sauerkraut. I also like miso, miso soup. It's a live bacteria. You're eating this live bacteria. That supports a lot. Um, be very careful with things that destroy the gut bacteria. So that would be sugar, alcohol, poor quality, high fatty foods, high poor quality carbohydrate foods, very processed foods. And number one thing is to get into that parasympathetic state in terms of eating habits and getting into the parasympathetic state. That's that rest and digest. You can do that by chewing. You can do that by laughing. You can do it by singing, by gargling. For eating, one of the, the best things you can do is to sit and eat your food. And we heal through connection. We heal with each other. So have a meal where you're eating the same food with your family, where you're sitting down and you're having conversation, you're enjoying the company of, of your family. That eating the same food with each other, food is communication, food is energy. It communicates with us, it, com it helps us communicate with each other. If one person's eating pizza, the other person's eating um, a steak, the other person is eating um, beans and rice, they're all different forms of communication. So you'll communicate better if you're all eating the same foods. So that's what I work with on my patients is to, you know, in a family that you all sit around, have good meals, and you eat, eat very similar foods. And that's all, so good luck and great. Okay. Dr. Cabal, do you have the clicker? Sorry. Thank you. <sighs> Thank you. 
Good morning. Um, my name is Tina Good. I'm one of the therapists at the Refuge Center. And, oops, very touchy. Um, I'm one of the therapists at the Refuge Center, and I'm so grateful to be here with you today to talk about the and and the togetherness of life. So I want to start out kind of like Kate did, if you're willing. I'd invite you to take a little... Um, imaginary painting class with me. So if you're willing, close your eyes or gently let your gaze fall. And I wanna introduce you to a woman in your mind's eye. This woman's approximately 40 years old, a wife, a mother, a Bible study leader, a professional having left a career to be a stay-at-home mother and care for her family, Got that image? Now I want you to imagine that this woman is in pain. She's in a pain so great that she often finds herself at home or in her car alone, crying. A pain so great that she grows more and more distant. A pain so great that she loses sleep at night and is exhausted during the day dealing with a pain so great that she ultimately finds herself prostrate on the floor, praying that God will take her or her child just so the pain will stop. Do you have that image? Is there any part of you that can relate to any part of her? All right, open your eyes. This is that woman I was that woman. The world saw one part of me and there were other parts that I was afraid to let anyone see. What would they, what would you think of me? How did I and how did any of us get to that place in life? You know, we're becoming more and more disconnected. We have so many advances in technologies and yet, if you go to a restaurant, have you ever noticed people sit at the phone and they text each other across the table? Um, if we get in an elevator, we don't want to really talk to each other. Oh, we'll just pick up the phone and start answering our emails, right? Cigna did a study and found that nearly half of the people admit to feeling lonely or isolated at least some of the time. And this is becoming more and more frequent in our millennials and our Gen Xers. It's an epidemic and the proportions are growing and just as was mentioned earlier today, it's really impacting our health and mortality. Now there are many causes, you know, social media being one of them, but also work, work demands, and sometimes we just find ourselves in stages of life such as when we're home raising small children or if we're facing empty nesters or as we lose spouses, the incidence of loneliness grows. But I really wanna to focus today on that toxic stress and shame and trauma that leads to loneliness in our life and isolation. So we come into this world and we are absolutely worthy and enough we are worthy simply because we are. We know how to express our needs and no one judges us based on what size clothes we wear or what our title is or what our bank account number is. We're worthy just because we are. So what changes in our lives? Well, life happens. And we begin internalizing those things. We shift from seeing ourselves as just like everyone else with humility and compassion, and we start fearing that there's something different or wrong with us, and we start pulling back and disconnecting many times to keep others from seeing what we know is inside. Toxic shame takes the words, the events, the trauma, the neglect, the way we perceive things, our comparison, and it starts distorting the truth. This often happens early in life. We feel sad and we're told, 
dry up those tears. It's not that important. Just move on. We learn to stuff our feelings. We decide that we want to be a ballerina or an artist or a cowboy or an astronaut. And we're told, oh no, you are too much this or not enough that. You can't make a decent living doing those things. So we stuff our dreams and disconnect. Trauma impacts all of us differently. What affects one person may not affect the next, but it ultimately leads to toxic shame and begins to hide the worth of who we truly are. And we grow more and more disconnected because that toxic shame lies. We begin hiding parts away and that worthy child gets locked away. We want connection, but we're afraid of connection. We start telling ourselves lies. Well, I'm really all messed up. I'm broken, I'm not enough. And this leads to the loneliness of disconnection. Now our minds, um, I believe Dr. Cabell talked about this, are, are hardwired for survival and that's a good thing. We need to survive. But what happens is that when we're put in a stressful situation or a traumatic situation, our survival mind kicks in and our emotional mind checks out. So I don't know about y'all, but I really hate snakes. Really hate snakes, even on TV. So if I'm standing up here and all of a sudden I see a snake start slithering across the stage, I am not gonna stop and go, hello, Mr. Snake. Are you a poisonous snake or a garden snake? I'm just gonna run as fast as I can and I'm gonna get out of here, which is gonna be pretty funny. Um, the same way with some people. If rocks are coming at you, not only are the rocks dangerous, but the person that's throwing the rocks is dangerous too. And I don't know about you, but I'm gonna protect myself because I also don't like getting hit with rocks. Those rocks and stones in our life take a lot of different um, shapes. They can be words, they can be situations, they can be divorce, they can be any of those adverse childhood experiences and they can be experiences when we become adults. And as those things happen, we start building walls to protect ourselves. In 2006, when addiction squarely took aim at my family, the stress and the trauma grew large. I started building walls because I told myself, it's all my fault. I failed as a mother. I mistakenly believed that things like this didn't happen in families like mine. We were a good Christian family. I thought I had done all the things right, but apparently I'd failed. And so I became a master engineer. I just kept working on that wall that I had started constructing as a little child. And I talked less and less to my family because they'd ask how things were going and I didn't wanna tell them the truth, but I also didn't wanna lie. So I just grew more and more remote. I looked at my friends whose children were going off, you know, doing everything they had to do to get in the right school. And the comparison set in. And so I just got less chatty and more busy with other things so that I wouldn't have to talk. I knew what perfect families looked like because I had seen them on TV. I saw them on Facebook. I saw him in my neighborhood, and I knew that I wasn't living in one of those perfect families when we closed the door at night. So I did everything I could to put on a really pretty shiny mask when I went out in public so that no one could see, and then I tried to control everything and everyone in my life until I was exhausted. I did all of these things because it was the best I knew how to do at the time. Chip died in Voice of the Heart, which was also mentioned earlier, and we didn't discuss that, says that pain is a gift. Now, doesn't that sound prolific? Pain is a gift. Well, 
I think he's probably right, but it certainly doesn't feel like it at the time. But if we choose to listen to the pain, it tells us something. It teaches us. It informs us. You know, if, if we were to have chest pain, if you had chest pain or arm pain, would you go and listen, do something about it? Why then will we not sometimes listen to the emotional and relational pain when it's trying to inform us and tell us something? Now, I have to tell you at this point that it is absolutely by the grace of God. My therapist, some very dear friends, my people, my community, that I listen and that I am standing here today. Change was absolutely required for me and I needed community in order to change. So this is where the ampersand comes into my story. The sorrow, the pain, they became gratitude and transformation. Darkness and light, sadness and joy, all in community. And I began living in the ampersand. The ampersand is an inclusive symbol, meaning and. If you connected to any part of that image in your mind, you know that we are all part of common experience. We share emotion, we share experience. It is part of the human condition and part of our common humanity. In Ecclesiastes, we're told that two are better than one. Two get more work done, and if one falls, there's another one there to pick them up. But if one falls and there's no one, they're alone. Living in the ampersand in community with one another. Now, I think nature can be a great teacher too. And there are a lot of geese out where I live. Um, and you might notice that the geese fly in formation, and you might have heard that geese fly in a V formation because it gives them uplift. And actually, the geese can fly 71% further in this V formation than they could if they tried to strike out on their own. What I find really interesting, though, and you may not know this, is that if one goose becomes injured or sick, two geese go down with the injured goose to protect it and be with until either the injured goose dies or it recovers and then they strike out and find a new formation together or made up with their original flock. The geese understand this need for connection and so did we in the very beginning. As children, we come into this world, as babies, we're born reaching out and needing connection. That's because as humans, we have to have connection, right? Our very survival depends on connection. So have you ever seen a hungry baby? And what does that hungry baby do? And what does it do louder if you don't respond to the original signal? We have needs, and yet we often tell ourselves we're needy. We have needs. We need to let others know. The book of Matthew gives us our greatest commandment, that we're to love God with our entire heart, mind, and soul. We're also to love others as we love ourselves. God, self, and others. This, too, is connection. Now, I'm a real big Brene Brown fan. Um, I think she's wonderful. If you're not familiar with Brene, I would encourage you to find anything that she's written or does. Um, but Brene puts it this way, that connection, that we're made for connection. It's what gives the purpose and meaning to our lives. So what do we do when we want connection, when we feel unsafe? When we have those walls and we don't know how to reach out, 
Now, I'm not suggesting that we run out of here and we start tearing down those walls and, you know, any of those things, that we start posting everything on Facebook and reaching out and saying, hey, I just need somebody to talk to, listen to, let me tell you what's happened in my life, because that's not safe. Some people have not earned the right to that kind of intimacy in our story. And sometimes, even those close to us are not um, where we need to go to process through some issues. But what I am saying is that pain is the dis-ease, loneliness is the symptom, and connection is the cure. So how do we find safe people? Well, I think first we start off by becoming safe within ourselves. Again, Brene Brown talks about the concept of braving. We do this for ourselves. We find other people that know how to do braving. Set boundaries. We say yes or no. We give ourselves permission to say no. It is a complete sentence. We practice reliability. We say what we're going to do and we're accountable. We practice the concept of vault, which means if you tell me something, I'm gonna hold that in confidence. I'm not gonna talk about you with the next person. You're gonna hold what I say in confidence and you're not gonna talk about me with someone else if I'm not there. We're people of integrity and we Greet others with non-judgment, accepting them for who they are. And we practice this concept of generosity, which means I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt until you prove otherwise, knowing that we all make mistakes. We all, you know, get ruffled a little bit. We have that stress. We've talked about that. And I'm going to go back to you and repair that relationship, knowing that sometimes things just come out a little sideways. I'm not gonna judge you for that. I'm gonna give you the benefit of the doubt and reconnect. We listen to ourselves and we respond to the needs that we have. Now, I'm a therapist, right? So I'm gonna tell you therapy's good. And it is. But I also want you to know that the healthiest, bravest people walk through the doors at the Refuge Center every single day. But besides therapy, you know, there may be trusted friends, family, pastors, spiritual directors, 12-step programs, groups, support groups, groups for people going through the same stage of life that you're going through, small groups at church. There are many ways to start connecting So going back to 20 or 2006, I first reached out. I was, I was in a Bible study. There were about 200 people in that Bible study with me. I was in leadership with 35 of those women. I reached out to about three. That's just over 1% of the people in that group had the kind of safety that I felt comfortable reaching out to. And the reason was because they didn't try to fix me. They didn't try to minimize what I was going through. They didn't say, oh, it'll get better or it could be worse. They just listened. They were just there. And a well-timed, oh, sweetie, was a soothing balm to my hurting heart. Then, with the help of my therapist, 12-step work, a community of friends, my people, my tribe, my community became my lifeline. Now, the good thing is, just as we learn to build those walls and put up those defenses, neuroscience is now telling us that we can unlearn and relearn things. We can form new neural pathways. And that's good, our brains are malleable and that can occur at any age. So as we start practicing new skills and techniques, 
we can start changing the way our brain thinks. Those old automatic thoughts can be replaced with thoughts of gratitude and acceptance. Our anxiety can actually be lessened when we start focusing on the present moment. Those geese, they fly together, right? Because they go 71% further in community. In community, we can move faster and better to a new way of thinking when we work together. And by working together in community through connection, we all become healthier. We take the lies out of the darkness in a safe environment and start dissecting them. And we find that in the light, they lose power. They're spoken and it's no longer hidden shame. We find out that we are all the same. We hear the words, me too, me too. We have a men's group that Pike um, and Weston, two of our therapists, lead on a regular basis. And in that group, I've heard that men find that they can be strong and they can have emotions. They can be brave and they can be fearful simultaneously. I also have the, have the absolute joy of working with our Wounded Hearts group, which is for women that have experienced childhood sexual abuse. And it is amazing and humbling to watch on a regular basis as women come together in community and hear others say, I thought it was my fault and find that no, what happened, what happened was wrong. It was wrong and you're not alone. And then they learn that they can find hope together and reclaim the story of their own lives. Our healthy relationships group, great place to start practicing all these concepts in safe community. Living in the ampersand, for me, means I don't know how to do the slide. Ah, wait a minute. Um, oh, let me give you an update. So let me tell you what's happened, because this is living in the ampersand for me. Seen, connected, safe, soothed, secured. From the darkest moments, the most transformation. My greatest pain has become my greatest joy. I now have the opportunity, I graduated with my, with my degree in clinical mental health counseling and now have the joy of walking with people every day to find hope and healing. That beautiful boy is now a man in long-term recovery and he walks daily with other people as they find recovery from addiction in his own life. And my wonderful husband, who continues to be one of my biggest fans and supports, he took the photo this time, he wasn't in it. A special thank you, because some of my community's here. A special thank you um, to you for all that we've shared, all that we continue to share, all that we will continue to share. Connected, safe, soothed, seen. Living in the ampersand, we all experience those times of hardship and calm, celebration and sorrow, gains and losses, rain and sunshine, work and play, tears and laughter, and we'll do it all together with one another connected. Thank you so much. I am so truly grateful and blessed to be here.
That concludes the end of our speaker portion. We're just going to take 10 minutes um, to do a quick Q&A if you have questions for any of our speakers. And we know some of you have 12 o'clock meetings, lunch dates. If you need to scoot, we completely understand. We will plan to wrap within the next 10 minutes, though. So Amy Cochran is going to be walking around with that microphone. And all you have to do is just lift a hand if you have a question for any of these four. Thank you to all of you very much. Um, Dr. Cobble, Cable, how do I say that? <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> so when my youngest brother graduated Millsaps, the man, the guy that was reading English said, Jason Scrabble. And I was like, oh, it's Cabble, <laughs> Scrabble. So. Cabble. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, I just have a quick question. Um, when you were talking about the um, dysfunctions that kind of underlie trauma and what constitutes that, I was just curious if you have done any research yourself or if you can direct me to any research on the role that racial discrimination plays in trauma. Yeah, that's a great one, actually. I had meant to kind of hit on that, but there were a lot of things I sat and I was like, oh, I meant to say this and this and this and this and this. But fortunately, like Kate and Tina, everybody hit on that. Yeah, I think you look at um, racism in this country, uh, the American Indian, those kind of things. Like there's a huge role of generational trauma in those populations. And I think we've done a horrible disservice um, to not really talk about that. Like it's not anything. And, and I think um, one, as far as a resource, um, Dr. Nadine Burke has some great stuff um, around some of that. And then actually Mark Wallen's book goes into that um, in chapter two or three towards the end, there's been a lot of work. Rachel Yehuda, who's Jewish, um, has done a lot of work um, in that population as well. Um, I, you know, there's part of my story I never talked about here, but um, I did a lot of EMDR the first several months. I was in therapy, I mean, a ton. At one point, my wife took the kids to the beach and I literally did EMDR every day for a week um, with Tyner for like two hours a day. And it took me six months to get to kind of this legacy burden I was carrying. It was something that I think had happened to my mom that she's probably never talked about. Um, and so we know through, um, the other thing I didn't talk about, in twins, so it's very interesting talking about non-coding DNA, there are twin studies that show one twin can inherit a family legacy trauma and the other not, right? So there are a lot of things, our children are all different. They we carry different things from us and from our parents. And so you, when I, when I'm informed of that now and I look at inner city Chicago, you know, inner city New Jersey, New York, those kind of places, anywhere, it's like I said at the end, everybody's doing the best they can with where they are. Like we all are. And you have to think about the total cumulative generational impact in the current generation and how those things are affecting them. So we have a lot of work to do. It's why I'm so passionate about getting out and shouting from the rooftops about a place like Refuge because Refuge enables people without means to get the best care we have in this county, in this region. It's amazing. So Mark Wallen, Nadine Burke, those are the two I can think of right now. Hi, this is Dr. Campbell again. Um, I have a question if there's something similar uh, as the adverse childhood experiences scale for young adults with, say, the brain developing until 25, maybe precortex till 30, if that's needed or. That's a good your question. I'd have that. to pass to Amy. Okay. Um, yeah. I think, yeah. <laughs> I think it's with the sound system, the feedback is hard to hear, but I think you're asking, is there a, like an A score for adults? Like, is there a way if you're over 25, is there something that you can look at and go tick the box and stuff? What, what comes to mind for me for that, honestly, because everything gets back to childhood, is actually the ACA laundry list. I don't know if you've ever looked at that or Googled it, but it's, um, like I said at the beginning, like I have all 14 of those. Um, and I own it now. Like that's, you know, it's, Tina said it great. And I, I love the thing you said, which was, out of pain comes redemption. Like until I could actually face my pain and I'm still facing it and I'm still growing and it's like an onion I keep peeling. Um, what I thought was my, the, the worst thing about me has been my greatest attribute. So. 
The only thing, this is just anecdotal that I would add from my own story, was that when the stakes got high enough in my adult life, it triggered a lot of things that were still kind of residual. And it was kind of the straw that broke the camel's back that finally took me to the point of absolute transformation, which redemption I'm grateful for. Yeah, it goes back to that video at the beginning where he opens the door as an adult and all those trash bags are still there. They don't go away. Kate, could you repeat the, uh, the image that you gave of, of you, you lift up yourself, but you can see what the dysfunction is and it's separate? You know what I'm talking about? Meditation at the end and you separate, you not identify. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Um, so... That for me comes from a mindfulness practice called RAIN. It's an acronym. So um, R is for recognize, A is for allow, I is for investigate with kindness. Now they've changed it. Um, the original was non-identify. And that's kind of where I really started to learn about that. Um, and and what, that, what that means, at least to me and, and what I've studied and what I've seen in meditation is we have this ability as we practice to take on what is called the witness self or the observer. So oftentimes we think like, I am anxiety. I am, you know, this is who I am. This is who I am. And as you, you, you kind of watch your thoughts instead of getting caught up in them, um, you take on this uh, practice of, of noticing or of witnessing. And what that does is it gives you a little bit of space. Um, there's a fascinating practice that I do um, in groups is I'll have people, um, I actually think you mentioned it, name it to tame it. So what happens when we get triggered and you know a, a lot is happening in the mind and the body. So if you can actually take one of the experiences and write it out on a piece of paper and look at it, or I'll have them write it out on a whiteboard. Again, it, it gives a little bit of room. It gives a little bit of space because there's one part of you that's experiencing it. And then this witness part can step to the side and look at it. And then you're going, oh, I'm both. I'm the one who's experiencing, yet I'm also the one who's noticing the experience. And so that's where I think we can kind of pull, pull apart um, and give some space to who we really are. Hope that answers your question. This one is for Summer. Um, regarding gut health, um, are you an advocate for supplements in addition to healthy eating? And if so, what would you recommend? Yes, I'd actually do both. Um, I think food is by and large the most powerful way to change your health. So that always is the first thing that I start with when I talk to, talk to people. Um, I think now the supplements, I, I do recommend a lot of supplements um, depending on what's going on in the condition. Um, most people um, get a probiotic. Um, along with the fermented foods, I'll do a probiotic. The ones that I like right now that are out there are called spore-based probiotics, and um, they're actually spores, so they're not the lactobacillus and bifidobacterium that you would get in the traditional type probiotic, but they're spores, and so um, they're usually a bacillus species, but you take them and they, they survive the environment, get into the gut, and then cause the good bacteria to grow. And they clean up some of the not so helpful bacteria too. So those are the ones that I'm using the most. Um, the one you can, they're also called soil-based probiotics. Um, so Dr. Mercola makes a nice one. I don't have any ties to anyone but um, he makes a nice one called uh, Spore Restore that you can get, I think, turnip truck sells it. So 
So she nailed it earlier. Um, Jason Sonnenberg is one of the key lead researchers for the Human Microbiota uh, Project at Stanford, and he's written a book called The Good Gut. And in it, he says, this current generation of Americans has the narrowest spectrum of gut flora of any human ever walked the planet. We also have the highest amount of anxiety and depression. Just something to think about. I think a lot of that too is that lack of diversity in our diets and also because we're so clean. So the food is sprayed with, you know, the herbicides and pesticides make it really clean, the antibiotics make it really clean, and all those things are also cleaning up our guts. And so we're getting weaker and weaker and weaker for, for those reasons. And I think a lot of that too, you know, it, it's correlated a lot with chronic illness and especially in the autism spectrum, you see the the rates of pesticides like Roundup, it's paralleling the rates of autism. And so we need to make our food a little dirtier and our environment a little dirtier. So eat dirt, eat dirty food, that type of thing. It helps, it really makes a big difference. Okay, we're gonna practice good boundaries and stop there. Um, I have a quick blessing to send you all out with. This is Dee Simone. May light always surround you. Hope kindle and rebound you. May your hearts turn to healing. May your heart embrace feeling. May your wounds become your wisdom. Every kindness a prism. May laughter infect you. May your passion resurrect you. May goodness inspire your deepest desires. And through all that you reach for, may your arms never tire. Thank you for being a part of Live Intentionally 2019. I'll encourage our speakers to stay down here in the front if you have additional questions. And stay in touch with the Refuge Center. Thanks, everyone.